Welcome to Deep CV Diving, a podcast where I dive deep into the CVs of industry leaders to find the pearls of wisdom to help you in your career. I'm your host, Graham Seldon, and as an executive recruiter and career coach with over 25 years experience, I've conducted thousands of interviews and I never get bored. And that's because by carefully asking the right questions and being interested in people's stories, no interview is ever the same. And there is often much to learn about what drives leaders in our field. After each recording, I reflect on some of the most salient points in the interview and go back and take a deep dive into what they've said. With each guest, I explore what steps did they take to get where they are now? What advice would they give to their younger selves? And how have they navigated the highly political and competitive businesses they work in. Let's dive deep and find out. My guest in this episode is Laura Nichols, who is the Chief Client Officer for Clifford Chance. It's a global role focused on leading a transformation and change project across business development and client-focused strategies. Welcome to the podcast, Laura. Hi, thanks, Graham. Now, I always start these interviews by going right back to the beginning when you did your degree and you you did a Bachelor of Business Marketing. Did you always want to be in marketing? Yes. So um, there's probably a a fun fact that you don't know about me, Graham. Um, But my first role, um, my first real job out of of school was actually as a chef. So I I worked in uh, Melbourne, Australia, um, in a restaurant called Toofies, which was a three-hatted restaurant at the time. I know it. And undertook a, a four-year uh, chef's apprenticeship, which I um, was very good at, actually, I would say. I won Apprentice of the Year during my time, but decided after four years of 80-plus of hours um, that it wasn't the career for me longer term and um, and was looking really for, for the next adventure. Um, and my mother at the time was a university lecturer at RMIT, uh, specialising in services marketing. And so having sat on the sidelines, watching her um, really build her career and, and really specialise into services marketing, um, it was something that obviously interested me. Um, I spent a lot of time really sitting with her, really understanding what it looked like and what career opportunities might come off the back of a a degree of that nature and decided as a mature age student to go off to university. So I didn't join university uh, straight out of high school. I I was a late bloomer, um, one would say. Um, so and also went to RMIT. So um, in my second year at RMIT, I actually had my mum twice as a lecturer, <laughs> uh, which was quite interesting. Um, and you know, through that time, very much drilled in the four P's and the seven P's of services marketing. But that's really what what spiked the interest in terms of me undertaking a Bachelor of Business Marketing. Gosh, you must be the only guest I've had so far whose mother would actually understand what you do for a living. (laughs) I still get it, actually. Many, many years later, my mum's still constantly asking me about services marketing and case studies and brainstorming things with me. Um, So it has its pros and it also has its cons. cons. (laughs) Is she super proud of you? She is. She is. Both my parents are. Um, I kind of come from a, a strangely high achieving family. My parents are both in their 70s and still working. Um, my mum's completed her doctorate and is currently studying professorship and has been sponsored to do so. Amazing. And my dad actually requalified about seven years ago as a lawyer. So he's now practicing as a lawyer in his, in his early 70s. Oh, my goodness. Um, so, yes. <laughs> so I've, I somehow some, come full circle <laughs> and now surrounded by lawyers because oh. my husband is also a lawyer. Oh. Um, and then also on the other side, um, my mum and my sister being kind of within the, the marketing world. So, so, so yes <laughs> that's inc- that's incredible so, do, do you miss chefing at all like is cooking something that you still do I do I don't have a lot of time to do it but if you if you ever do come to my kitchen in London you'll see I've got pretty much every single gadget you could possibly imagine and knowing the size of kitchens in London you could probably imagine what my kitchen looks like <laughs> um, <laughs> but when I do have time I very much enjoy cooking I don't tell a lot of people that I'm a chef. Obviously, probably more people will find out off the back of today. (laughs) Um, And I always like surprising people when they're coming over expecting to have a chili con carne or something when I pull out, um, you know, a chocolate souffle dessert. (laughs) Amazing. Okay, so tell us about your first job after studying then, because that was in a sort of more business environment. 
That's correct. So my first um, job actually while studying, um, I started and then continued to work within that field for some time post-university, was actually working within aerospace and defence industry. Mm -hmm. And so my father at the time had built a career within aerospace engineering and running a business out in Australia, um, had kind of introduced me to that world, a very exciting world of fighter jets and all sorts of things. And so that was my first uh, real kind of, I suppose, professional job outside of university. So I worked for an Australian um, aerospace and defence company Mm -hmm. um, that had operations in the States, but obviously quite an international business. And I joined at a time, actually, when there was a lot of um, collaboration between Australia and joint states around the Joint Strike Fighter. So quite an exciting time to be um, within the aerospace and and defence industry. It was also quite interesting in terms of the skill set really developed in that space as well, obviously working with engineers and also very similar applicable skills in terms of how you go to market and the business development strategy. Uh, so so a good foray into this type of world, mm. but more exciting in terms of going out and visiting aerospace plants and um, seeing production lines um, in terms of fighter jets and and travelling around, um, visiting various air shows and the like. Mm. So, which leads into my next question, which is, you got to the point of being a manager there, and then you joined Deacons, a sort of small law firm at the time in, in Melbourne, and took a role as a senior coordinator. So, I'm interested, why did you choose to join a law firm after the sort of dizzy heights of aerospace? And were you not concerned about downgrading in title? So... For me, really, the move across was one to get into a larger industry more than anything else, Mm -hmm. um, and one that I had ambition around to actually travel and work internationally and abroad uh, within. I had a couple of friends that were lawyers, actually, at Deakins at the time. Mm -hmm. One of my very good friends um, was was a young associate over there, and, um, and she mentioned to me that there was opportunities within the BD space, and I at the time I didn't really... Uh, look into it too much. But I remember one day sitting at home and opening the age newspaper back in the day where you go to the careers section and they had all the job ads <laughs> going showing my age and seeing a role pop up for Deacons. And I thought, okay, this is interesting. And so effectively threw my hat in the ring, um, not quite sure which direction it was it was going to take me, but went through the interview process, was really excited about the role um, and the people I met through that process. And I saw it really as an opportunity for me to move into quite a professional environment, um, Mm -hmm. quite a progressive environment. A lot of um, kind of women in senior leadership positions, which you don't usually see um, within the aerospace and defence industry. Mm -hmm. And and an opportunity for me to to really carve a career that hopefully would take me abroad at some time. Mm. And so, so yes, that that was really the motivator at the time to move across a pretty safe environment because obviously I had friends over there that that spoke very highly of the firm um, and at the time the firm was very much connected into APAC so an opportunity hopefully um, at that stage to to spend more time actually traveling more internationally um, within the APAC region um, but that was a real motivator for me. In terms of the downgrade of, of title, I kind of took that on board as 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 kind of a given in terms of associated with the role. But obviously, for me, thought that actually I'd be able to kind of move up through the ranks quite quickly, um, Mm -hmm. given that I had been operating in a manager position and actually had been probably operating um, to some extent at more senior manager position in terms of the responsibilities I had in, in my previous role. Let's take our first deep dive here to reflect on this moment. Laura took this job, which was the start of her legal BD career, which has seen her ascend to a global BD leader for one of the world's largest law firms. What is interesting is her willingness to take a role more junior in title than she had been operating at, because she saw it as part of a bigger plan, a stepping stone to a career in an international industry. We often advise candidates to see the bigger picture rather than fixate on job title or level if the role itself is going to be the step you need to take to achieve your overall career goal. Let's return to the interview. Similarly to a previous guest, um, Heather Vagdama, who we've had on the show, you moved from Melbourne to Asia, which was quite a big thing to do at that time. I mean, there weren't a lot of people moving to Asia in professional services, so... 
Talk us through the decision-making process and, and why you went. Uh, so Asia was a place I spent a lot of time in um, as a child. My mother uh, spent a lot of time in Hong Kong, actually, um, at Hong Kong University. So um, over the course of 12 months, my mum would have probably six months of her time actually out in Hong Kong. Um, and, and as children, we spent a lot of time traveling between Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, my parents really enjoyed Asia. And, um, and then as I uh, moved into um, my career, um, actually within aerospace and defense, Singapore was, was one of those hubs. I, I spent a lot of time on the ground um, as well, um, particularly around the Singapore Air Show. And so I had aspirations to move into Asia. I had also studied in China. And so for me, uh, an opportunity to move to Asia was kind of the real driver um, more than anything else. And so I was obviously scanning the market to look for an opportunity to move into a big firm um, with a solid footprint across Asia. And the opportunity came up with Baker and McKenzie at the time to um, be based in Singapore, um, managing a, a, a team uh, aligned into the international Asia team. Um, but also looking after Asia capital markets. And you recall at the time that was in the height of pre-financial crisis time, so a really, really exciting time to move out to Asia and a very exciting time to be really plugged into capital markets across Asia. Um, so the role for me um, had a lot of pluses, um, not only the fact that it was based in Asia, which was something that I very much desired, um, but obviously an opportunity to really travel um, within Asia, but being plugged into to a global firm. Um, so that was a real motivator for me in terms of moving out um, to Asia. Um, I was also young and single, um, so a fantastic opportunity to do something without having a huge amount of baggage. And so the timing, um, which is also really critical when you're making these type of moves, was right as well. Um, so kind mm -hmm. of on a personal level, also a driver um, to get out there and explore the world. And looking back, you've had global roles for over a decade. Did that time in Asia help you in your job today? Absolutely. Um, Asia, um, for, for many firms that I've worked at over my time, has been one of the jewels in the crown. Um, you know, huge amount of growth over the last, you know, 15 years. Um, and, you know, having time out on the ground and, and working um, in smaller offices um, and understanding what it's like to be in smaller offices connected up into a larger infrastructure, I think brings you a huge amount of valuable skills and really understanding how to navigate and how to get things done across smaller offices, but also understanding the challenges that people might have in those offices in terms of the, the demand on their time. It also connects you in in terms of understanding different cultures, which is incredibly important in international roles. And so, you know, appreciating particularly working here in the UK, how you might actually translate things um, to different markets in terms of go-to-market strategy, how you engage with clients in different markets, what that looks like, and how you need to nuance uh, client programs and the like around that. So I it, it was incredibly invaluable for me. Um, in terms of really building the skill set. It was also incredibly valuable to me in terms of resilience as well. You know, being out in Asia in particular, in BD roles, they can be quite tough roles, mm -hmm. you know. And so those skills for me in terms of kind of softer skills, I think have been incredibly invaluable um, to me is in terms of really being able to kind of build that capability around myself as I've moved into more senior roles over time. Mm -hmm. And there was then came this period in your career where you moved jobs every year for three years. I did. <laughs> um, which, which, is, which is often seen as a real negative. And so how do you counter that is the first part of that question. You know, what, why did you do that, I suppose? And secondly, what do you, does it inform your decision-making slightly differently when looking at other candidates in the market who may have moved several times in a short space of time? I think, so I'll answer your first question, uh, sorry, your last question first. first. Um, absolutely. I, I think as long as the reasons why you have moved are explainable and you're not just jumping around for title, um, it, it, you know, I, I, I will always look at candidates and, and really want to hear their story um, and also sometimes share my story. 
Um, so I did. I I, um, I moved three roles in three years. Um, so I was at Baker and McKenzie Capital Markets, as I said, and then the financial crisis hit. And obviously, capital markets came to an absolute grinding halt. I, uh, being young and single and living in a foreign country, started to get a bit worried about uh, whether a firm needed a business development manager, helping them on capital markets work when there was none actually taking place. And it was a time where I think you'll recall there was just a huge amount of um, attrition, um, redundancies uh, across the whole of the legal sector and and obviously the banking sector and, and many other sectors as well. So um, Herbert Smith had been brewing in the background for some time and um, and I thought, okay, this is probably a wise move to really protect me more than anything else um, and to ensure some longevity around um, the fact I really wanted to stay in Asia. And so, you know, ended up having the conversations with, with Herbert Smith and moving across to Herbert Smith. The move from Herbert Smith to London is an interesting one and more of a personal one. So whilst at Herbert Smith, I met my uh, now husband, <laughs> um, who at the time was a young associate in their energy group on succumbent from London. Um, he too was a victim of the financial crisis um, with Herbert Smith uh, retracting a number of their succumbents and relocating him back into London. And so we did long distance for a period of time um, with him trying to make his way back to Singapore and me trying to figure out if I can find a way to move into London um, at the height of the financial crisis when there was literally no opportunity to do so. He found it very, very difficult to find any opportunity out in, in Asia. Then I struck gold um, with a maternity cover in London um, so travelled over to London with a 12-month contract on a youth mobility visa that I'd managed to swing <laughs> <laughs> on a quick trip to Canberra. Um, not quite sure how this was all going pl to play out, having known a guy in Singapore for the whole extent of about six months before he moved back and um, and throwing absolute caution to the wind. And, and uh, yes, and, and kind of the rest is history. It's great to hear her story of why she moved three times in three years. And I'm sure at the time she probably felt like her career was losing direction. But she had confidence in her ability and also she was open to what the universe would deliver. It's a good reminder that sometimes the best laid plans don't always work. But maintaining a positive attitude and finding an interim solution, like in this case a maternity leave contract, can actually lead to better things. As I mentioned in the intro, you returned to Clifford Chance to lead a major transformation and change project for business development and marketing. How do you approach this? So I think particularly in our roles, um, where you're trying to create, run big change projects that affect business services, it is absolutely mission critical that you have a really strong stakeholder group around you. And when I say stakeholder group, it needs to be a cross section of other business professionals and within business services and partners. You you need that because you need to um, effectively have um, what I call the army of of change ambassadors within the organisation. So I think first and foremost, identifying who those change ambassadors are, the people that have influence in the business, and the people that can help you get things done, is really important. And then within the change ambassador community, the ones that are, you know, that you've identified to really help you drive the change forward. There's a lot of uh, consultation that I usually um, undertake, but persuasive consultation, I think I would probably call it. And within that, um, I've learned that the best way in order to get things done and really get people on board to support what you're trying to do is to be quite data-led in terms of the why um, and, and leading into the how. I think it works particularly well uh, with lawyers. Um, they want to understand what things really look like and being able to come to the table with, with you know, effectively the data that forms an argument as to the why, um, I think is incredibly powerful. And then through that persuasive consultation, getting them to the point of how we're going to do things is also very, very critical. I ensure a lot of communication. I think the rule of repetition back in the day um, was, was seven times you need to say something before it sticks. Uh, now they're saying it's in excess of 20 times before people really take on board the information. 
Um, so driving any sort of change project forward, you've got to consistently communicate into the business, the why and the how, and appreciate the fact that you need many different mediums to get that communication across um, consistently why and how, and then communicate back, replay what you've done um, and what the next steps look like in terms of moving things forward. Keep your change ambassadors close. Use them as supporters and advocates for change in the business and constantly move forward. Um, you know, you've got to drive change forward, I think, quite quickly as in, in most times because particularly in law firms, I think the one thing that, that plays out a lot is a lot of change fatigue. So if you want to get things done, you move quickly, you move fast, um, you build your ambassadors, you communicate like crazy and you get things done. I think for really, really big change projects, um, you know, you've got to kind of rely on your gut a little bit, but also on gut um, and and your experience. Rely on people outside of industry um, as well, you know, tidbits, insights, you know, speak to people that you know have run big change projects, um, ask them the questions as to, you know, if you were to do this again, you know, what would be the lessons learned? Have you got any advice for me? I actually reached out to um, people I'd worked in um, with in the past and people I know within the industry, um, particularly here in London, who had run big change projects to get their insights. And that's incredibly invaluable as well. Um, and I suppose a lesson in that is that People are always very um, willing to, to give their time, um, particularly in our industry, because it makes everyone um, more successful. And, you know, we want to be able to kind of drive change, I think, not only at an individual firm level, but obviously um, across the full profession as well. So change projects that affect business development in one firm and lessons learned from that, obviously, can be incredibly um, positively impactful in terms of the overall profession and where we want to take things forward. There's been so much change in the legal profession for business development and marketing over the last 20 years. So what do you think has been the biggest change that you've observed? Data and the digitalization of what we do and you know looking at the evolution of ai just in the last couple of weeks and how that's going to transform pretty much everything that we do you know that has been the number one change that i've seen um throughout my career you know although i did join at a time where we were kind of blackberry only um and and it was only limited to partners and it was only the senior partners that did have blackberries and we still had scanning machines and there were people with typewriters so there has been a huge amount of digital transformation that's happened in 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 my career but the acceleration of that is mind blowing and we've moved i think very very much forward into a space where using data driving data analytics, looking at business intelligence, thinking about how we win work, how we gain market share, you know, that is really professionalizing everything that we do. And that's absolutely where we need to be operating going forward. And I think where we where we will see things, um, where we will see evolution of that over the next couple of years is I think more AI, uh, more automation on directories, um, you know, pitch documentation, capability statements, social media, marketing collateral, you know, I think all of that administration or, or, you know, operational type business development will probably move more into the tech space. And I think what it means for us in BD is a need to actually think about how we evolve ourselves, constantly evolve ourselves to operate at a more strategic level to really build out and, and be seen as business advisors, really helping the business win work, win market share, beat the competition. <laughs> and so I think there is, uh, you know, I, I was speaking to a colleague earlier this week about um, AI and um, particularly in the pitching space. And um, and you get a lot of concern, I think, from business development professionals about what does that actually mean for us. But I always say embrace the change and evolve because the evolution, I think, will provide huge opportunity for business development professionals um, to really operate in the space that we have the capability to operate in, the skill set and the mindset to do so. Um, so embrace the change and, and evolve, I think, is very much the messaging around, you know, BD more generally. But yes, technology, data, digitalization has effectively changed um, the world, not only for us, but I think um, for the legal industry as a whole. 
One of the things that it, it can't change, though, is time zones. And, and you <laughs> had a global role for over a decade. How do you manage a global job? Like, how do you manage your time? I spend every morning um, really looking through my diary and being absolutely ruthless around the meetings that have gone into my diary, the things that absolutely must be present at and, um, and, and meetings and other things I can effectively deputise um, members of my leadership group to attend. And the other, the other point is you've, you've got to be really good at using your leadership group, you know, build the tribe around you, empower them, um, get them out working in the business, but also, you know, sharing information amongst the group. So we're, we're keeping each other informed. But, you know, I couldn't do this job if it wasn't for the people that um, work with me. And in a global role, having a really strong leadership group working with you is is absolutely key. It ensures that you've got the time that you need to focus on the things that really need your you need your insights, um, and it also ensures that you can really you know um, manage your diary, manage your time, and be most effective in the things that you need to do throughout your day. But yes, be ruthless, build a strong team around you, and and make sure you're triaging and and really empowering the people that you work with to actually take some of that burden from you. This was a great case study in time management, being absolutely ruthless in blocking out regular time slots, delegating to others in the team, and being highly selective about the meetings that you attend. Her downtime is also planned, and this is something I hear a lot from senior leaders in global roles. Having things that help you decompress and instigating some digital detox time in your day. How you plan work and non-work activities is vital to ensure you can turn up every day and be your best self. Let's return to the interview. And what about downtime? Do you plan downtime and what do you do in your downtime? Uh, so unsurprising, probably lots of cooking in my downtime. So for me, it's some, it's it probably as I've got older, it's it's something that I have really embraced even more, but spending a lot of time outdoors. Um, I love walking and the joys of living here in um, in London and, and where I'm located. I've got Richmond Park, Kew Gardens and Chiswick House within walking distance from, from where I live. So I spend a lot of time on the weekends, rain, hail, shine, snow, out um, walking, um, taking my very old dog. <laughs> Out, out for strolls. Um, so that for me is really important in terms of downtime. I also read quite a lot. Um, a bit geeky. I spend a lot of time reading um, lots of management books, um, but I enjoy learning new things. And, you know, I, I, I try and ensure I carve out time every day, actually, to read, even if it's only 10, 15 pages, just to try and spend a bit of time on on things that decompress and get me thinking, of, of, you know, of, of other things. Um I now have um, enforced a digital detox, so <laughs> I, I now keep the phone outside the bedroom and just try and, you know, have a bit of time for me um, throughout the course of the day to just have a bit of reflection time and um, and to do the things I want to do. But yes, you know, that downtime is incredibly important and um, and I think when you're younger, you don't respect it as much as you, you do when you're older, when you realise actually you can't go full throttle all the time. Um, mm. It's really important to have time to decompress um, and, and do the things you really enjoy so that you can bring your best self to, to your job and to, and to the workforce and to the workplace. So, yes, cooking, reading, being outdoors, spending time with my family and digital detox whenever I can do it. Thinking about your cooking, because I'm still, I'm still quite blown Intrigued. away by the fact <laughs> that you were a chef for four years. Do you think that there are skills that you learn as a chef and, you know, busy, hot kitchen, drama, deadlines, you know. Do you think there's something that you that you brought to your career in professional services that you learn in chefing? A hundred percent. You know, I talk about kind of building the resilience around yourself. Um, and I learned a lot of that being out in Asia, but actually I learned a huge amount of resilience being in the kitchen. It, it's tough particularly if you're working at the kind of the level that I was working at, you know, working in a, in a three-hatted uh, restaurant. It's tough, it's ruthless, it's long hours, very, very little downtime. It's weekends, it's your birthday, it's public holidays. Um, so learnt a lot around being quite resilient, agile, having to deal with situations that come up like 
uh, you know, the, the sous chef dropping the stock <laughs> on the way out of the kitchen, you know, out of the out of the cool room or something blowing up in the middle of service or burning your hand or cutting your hand, which I've had many a times and just having to wrap yourself up, pick yourself up and keep going. It taught me, I think, in a different form, but higher level of attention to detail. And so, you know, that in me, you know, just constantly striving um, to bring that level of discipline to what I do, both in the office and outside of the office, I think has has really helped me in terms of my career. And um, and then also personally, obviously, I can uh, wooze people with my uh, chocolate souffles. <laughs> <laughs> You can My make cakes to skills. pacify them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it all it always, I shouldn't tell you this, but um, you know, when you used to do um many, many years ago, you know, staff socials where you'd go and do the cooking classes outside the office and you'd, you know, everyone would be out and they'd be, you know, oh, we're gonna make a risotto today, and everyone would be making the risotto. And I always used to do these like fabulous risottos and no one could figure out why. <laughs> all years of making risottos, that's why. <laughs> Well, my final question for you is if you had a message to Laura Nichols who walked through the door of her first law firm in 2008 and you're looking back, what advice would you give her now? What would it be? Embrace it. Would I do anything differently? Maybe a few things. But I think the one piece of advice I would give my younger self is just embrace everything that comes. And I'm going to sound very old, but, you know, life is is such a journey and... And, you know, I, I could still be in Melbourne as a chef or, you know, in aerospace or living in Singapore. But every time something's come up, regardless of how scary it might have been at the time, I've embraced it. And um, and you'll be OK. <laughs> Embrace you'll it. Everything okay. will be OK. <laughs> well, the proof is in the pudding. If we're going <laughs> to use that analogy. And um, you certainly put all the ingredients together to have a very successful career. Thank you so much for coming on Deep CV Diving. It'd be very inspiring for a lot of younger managers as well who are looking at global careers in professional services. So it's been a real pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Graham. 